Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Thursday, February 29th, 2024. It is my great pleasure to be here with Professor Christopher J. Chang. Chris, it's wonderful to be with you. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thanks. I really appreciate the time. Chris, to start, would you please tell me your current titles and institutional affiliations? Uh, yes, so I'm currently the class of 1942 professor at UC Berkeley in the departments of chemistry, molecular and cell biology, and the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute. And I'm also a faculty scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, as well as an adjunct professor at, at UC San Francisco in the Department of Pharmaceutical Chemistry. Okay, so lots to unpack there because I know it's all substantive and indicative of all of the research that you're involved in. Let's start first with the affiliations, your professorship. Is it, a, is it one professorship that's split between the departments of chemistry and molecular and cell biology? Is that how that works? Yes, so my primary appointment is in the Department of Chemistry uh, with uh, joint appointments in both molecular cell biology and neuroscience. Is that to say that fundamentally you're a chemist who also does molecular and cell biology? Is that a good way to think about it? Exactly. What we do is, in a nutshell, study the chemistry of life. And we want to understand life at the atomic and molecular level. Does that make you, I know there's a unique field called chemical biology, where it's chemists who can do interesting things with molecules that don't exist in nature to probe biological questions. Is that part of the story as well for you? Yes, yes. So we wear a lot of different hats. And so I would say that some people would classify a lot of the work we do in the lab as chemical biology. Uh, other people would call us bioinorganic or bioorganic chemists in the more traditional sense. And then other parts of our research span into pure inorganic and materials chemistry as well. Tell me about the Helen Wills Neuroscience Institute. First, who is or was Helen Wills? Uh, so uh, Helen Wills was, uh, you know, a major donor a figure at uh, UC Berkeley. Um, I think that she was uh, a major sort of tennis player, <laughs> professional tennis player back in the day, but I'd have to go and look that up. Uh, but basically, she always had an interest in neuroscience as well as education, uh, teaching and research at UC Berkeley. And then so she endowed this institute, which has basically grown over the decades uh, to support neuroscience activities broadly on campus. And so one thing that's interesting about neurobiology and neuroscience at Berkeley is that we are just launching the first department of neuroscience this year. And so it's going to be under sort of a larger umbrella, sort of like the Beckman Institute and how it interfaces with core departments of teaching across the campus. Now that's interesting. Berkeley is such a, a pathbreaker in so many ways. Is it somewhat late to the game in establishing a neuroscience department now? Uh, to be honest, yes. Uh, I would say that neurobiology has been a division within molecular and cell biology for 30 years. But as sort of our sort of understanding of the brain is really in its infancy, bringing together stakeholders across campus, especially chemistry, different types of engineering, as well as now data science, statistics, et cetera, and electrical engineering in particular, uh, it's really a, a ripe time right, to form not only sort of a department of neurobiology, but a department of neuroscience. But Chris, it has been a long time coming. <laughs> as, as a member of the Neuroscience Institute, what is your interface with neuroscience generally? Yeah, so basically we're broadly interested in neurodegeneration, neurodegenerative diseases, and understanding the molecular basis of that, as well as new types of potential therapeutic and diagnostic applications from the chemistry side. So neurochemistry and chemical biology of the brain. Okay, so thinking about human health and therapies, this might anticipate my next question. Your affiliation with UCSF, is that to further integrate you with the, the biotech and the translational world in the Bay Area? Exactly, and so because Berkeley doesn't have its own medical school, uh, you know, the, the initial sort of start of UC Berkeley was that UCSF was supposed to be sort of a sister school and almost like a medical school for the campus. But of course, it's grown into its own a super strong and independent biomedical research uh, group in and of itself. And so having that sort of cross-disciplinary appointment across the Bay uh, really enables you to sort of bring the basic research that we do on this campus at Berkeley 
and to translate that to new sort of diagnostics therapies. On a day-to-day -day basis, what does that mean, being at UCSF? Are you in the medical school? Are you talking with biotech startups? Yeah, so, you know, we have a lot of different interactions across the Bay. Um, you know, so we, on an academic perspective, the, the, that department, you know, pharmaceutical chemistry, as well as pharma, cellular and molecular pharmacology, are sort of the sister programs uh, to the Department of Chemistry and the chemical biology program we have at UC Berkeley. And so we, you know, we share uh, students, we collaborate, um, we have joint retreats, as well as I did my first sabbatical, actually my first and only sabbatical at UCSF. Um, and so kind of uh, integrating into that. I would say that the, the biotech pretty much flows anywhere to any university uh, in the Bay. So it's not, uh, I guess, per se, having joint appointments across different UC campuses has any sort of advantage or disadvantage in that way, but it does uh, help you bump into more people who have uh, MD degrees as opposed to our, our basic science campus. Chris, the one affiliation of the honor that you have that might be a little less substantive, the class of 1942 chair. Is there something mm -hmm. special about the class of 1942? Uh, n not necessarily, except for they were incredibly generous to the campus. Uh, we have many sorts of class gifts uh, that are given over the years. And so that class decided to support professors in their sort of research and teaching missions. And so we're really grateful for the support from that class. All right. So all of your work within and beyond Berkeley in the Bay Area, I understand you've made a major life decision and you'll be leaving this soon and transfer. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a it, it, it's bittersweet to sort of uh, talk about it because we do love Berkeley and we've been uh, extremely happy and valued by the community here. Uh, but it's been 20 years uh, since we started. I started here in 2004 and it's uh, like any sort of scientist, you want to try new experiments and look to the future. Uh, you know, as opposed to uh, what you're doing in the present. And so the move to Princeton, my wife, Michelle Chang, and I are both professors across uh, different departments at UC Berkeley. And Princeton's made a really uh, compelling and generous offer for us to move. And so we're going to sort of take the leap and move uh, back east in the summer of 2024. Will you pursue a similar kind of dual uh, affiliation that will satisfy your interests? in both chemistry and biology? Yeah, yeah, so basically we're in discussions with the allied departments uh, in the Princeton Neuroscience Institute, as well as the Department of Molecular Biology at Princeton. And so there's lots of great synergy uh, between those two departments as well as chemistry. But it's also that the proximity, uh, New Jersey has a lot of contacts with the pharmaceutical industry. And so translating the basic research again to medicines. And then Princeton, like Berkeley, doesn't have a medical school, but there is proximity to both Columbia and all of the sort of things that are going on in New York City, as well as UPenn. And so it really provides, again, a, a brand new type of environment to explore. And I think that what we're interested in is really pushing a lot of our work further into neuroscience, as well as into translational. Uh, sort of applications of our basic science at this point in my career. It's a great opportunity for you to think about what's important to keep and to transfer over and what are some new research avenues to pursue. So on the former, first the nuts and bolts of picking up a lab. Are you taking your equipment? Are you going to get all new stuff? What is that going to look like? Yeah, actually, it's uh, kind of like uh, something borrowed, something new, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. And so I think that um, Basically, the, the entire group uh, is moving with us, and so they're sort of ready to pack up and start a new adventure. So we're actively recruiting new graduate students, undergraduate students, and postdocs at Princeton, but the current team is basically going to move almost uh, in its entirety. Uh, there's a couple people that will stay behind uh, because of sort of family considerations, but then after those uh, sort of obligations are done, uh, going to move uh, to Princeton as well. Uh, the equipment, we're going to take uh, probably the majority of the equipment. Uh, some of the equipment has to be left behind because of my uh, current affiliation as a faculty science with the Lawrence 
Berkeley National Laboratory. And so that is a Department of Energy uh, sort of lab. And so therefore, that's U.S. government property. So that will be obviously staying at all, all at UC Berkeley and the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Now, of course, there's a national lab at Princeton as well, the Plasma Physics Laboratory. Will yes. you pursue an affiliation there, given your interest in energy concerns? So I, I would say that, uh, to be honest, we're, we're going to be more freelancing the energy and sustainability research that we're doing. And I would say that's uh, exciting in its own way to sort of do things from the bottom up mm -hmm. as opposed to the top bottom, which is a lot of sort of Department of Energy and large sort of government centers. Uh, right now, we're most interested in using electricity to make compounds. And so the, the sort of the plasma uh, research is not something that we've sort of considered at, at this point. But like all things, once you learn about something, you get interested in it. And so uh, nothing's out of the realm of possibility. Chris, beyond just, you know, a new environment and being open to what that's going to offer you, do you have well-developed ideas of the kinds of research that you want to move into simply by virtue of being a professor at a different place? Yeah, so I would sort of say that, you know, we want to sort of delve more deeply into neuroscience and probably move uh, our, I would say, our studies from we started with zebrafish, mm -hmm. very simple, sort of transparent model organisms that are their simplest ones that are so-called vertebrates with a backbone. Uh, we've done a lot of sort of mouse work over the last like five to seven years. And I think that one opportunity is to really sort of translate that and move on to sort of primate systems. And ultimately, we'd like to go into humans. But I think that there is a trajectory for us to be able to do so with a new move and a fresh new start. Chris, let's now delve a little deeper into some of the major research questions you've pursued in your career. So one that's very obvious and interesting to me, your facility in both organic and inorganic chemistry and the way that that allows you to ask fundamental questions about things like the brain to battery and energy storage. What does that tell us about chemistry that you can you can ask these questions about things that seemingly have no complementarity to them? Yeah, so I, I get asked that sort of question a lot. Um, and what we do is we're basically guided by the periodic table. Mm -hmm. And we really view that as the sort of the elements of life. And so running theme in our laboratory is that we aren't wed to a particular part of the periodic table or a particular sort of set of elements per se, because they're all important and they all have sort of roles to play, not only naturally uh, within our bodies, but also the way that we sort of interact with the world around us. And I think that's one sort of theme where you can imagine the biomedical research that we do, the sort of chemical biology sort of interface as opposed to sort of the more sustainability and our sort of place in the planet. And that's why we got interested in energy science as well. And so we've kind of had these two sort of parallel tracks, but they all come back to the periodic table. So whether it's inorganic chemistry, which has to do with non-carbon elements, particularly metals, or organic chemistry where uh, we're made of carbon, right? And so therefore that becomes sort of front and center. We don't really have any biases. And so the just being so lucky to be able to recruit, you know, great students and postdocs from all over the world uh, to really sort of embrace this holistic approach to chemistry. Chris, I wonder if you've ever thought about what it's either called astrobiology or exobiology on the mm -hmm. specific basis of we need to keep a very open mind not to be biased as to what life might look like elsewhere. And if your expertise in both organic and inorganic chemistry might be a very valuable perspective, for example, you know, looking for biosignatures from telescopes or samples from Mars whenever they get back home. I wonder if you could reflect on that. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. I mean, I would say that, you know, obviously origins of life is a huge uh, sort of burgeoning field of chemistry. And there's really no answer because it becomes a bit of chemistry to philosophy of what is life and what what is an organism going to look like and what is the minimum set of elements that one needs? Uh, what I would say is that it all comes down to energy. And so it's the, the sustainability of life. Basically, you need energy to self-propagate. 
And so we sort of think about that in terms of carbon. And so, of course, the energy sort of science that we think about is greenhouse gases, too much CO2 in the atmosphere. But even that sort of question uh, on a sort of terrestrial scale is an imbalance of elements. So too much carbon in the atmosphere in the form of CO2 actually is reciprocated by too much nitrogen uh, from you know, nitrates and nitrites and other nitrogen oxides that pollute the soil and water from over, over farming. And so to get back to sort of the astrobiology question, what you can sort of think about is that, is there sort of this mosaic set of other types of elements out there that will sort of cause things to go out of equilibrium? And then if they're out of equilibrium, then obviously that, you know, sort of propagate certain types of signatures. Um, and so, you know, Francis Arnold has been working on a lot of sort of silicon based chemistry these days, and it's just one element down in the same family of the periodic table. You know, in certain instances, it wouldn't be surprising whether elements like that would be incorporated more broadly in other types of life forms in terms of like pure speculation terms of basic chemistry. I wonder if you think about origins of life from a chemistry and biology question, the way that cosmologists might think of the Big Bang and time equals zero, that there's an inherent unknowability about the very beginning. And if that bothers you. No, actually, it, it doesn't. I mean, that's, again, going back to like this North Star of the periodic table. Um, you know, humans, right, we, we create new elements. Uh, we can wash them and the periodic table is always expanding and so even with a relatively limited number of elements right they're only you know a, a little over a hundred elements everything around us is made up of those elements in different combinations and so really chemistry is something where you can see the unseen right so everything that we're doing this computer screen that we're sort of talking through the water that i'm drinking over here uh, the food that we eat, the air that we breathe, they're all elements in different combinations, different ratios, different amounts. An overall question about your research motivations and if there's a narrative over the course of your career. So, of course, it all starts with basic science, with curiosity-driven research. Mm -hmm. But both in your interest in translational biology and sustainability broadly conceived, if, if sustainability is the translational science of chemistry to some degree... I, I actually agree with that. I mean, I think the thing is, you know, we've been interested in understanding how life works, right, at a fundamental level. And that new knowledge, I think, is just, it is sort of gee whiz science. And it has value, right, for, for understanding sort of our place um, as a society on this planet. But of course, you want to sort of improve upon uh, the existence of everybody for the benefit of society. And I think that's you know, one of the areas that students especially are really keen on studying, uh, which is our own sort of sustainability. And so I would say that a lot of times when people talk about translational uh, sort of chemistry, they think about medicines, right, as the most common example, like the first antibiotic or the first sort of precision cancer drugs. And now, of course, neurodegeneration and aging is a huge topic. But Translational chemistry can be more broad than that. And I think that the energy question and sustainability in the environment is, is definitely translational chemistry in, in and of its own right. Now, for you, are these kinds of questions where the starting point might be societal benefit? Is this sort of a post-tenure pursuit or are these things that you've explored from the beginning of your faculty career? Oh, I would say it's been at the very beginning. I mean, I think the thing is you... In order to do things that are applied, you have to start with basic. And so it's sort of like the opposite of the alphabet. You have to actually do B before A. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so I think it's something that we've had a long-term vision in which we, we do want our research to be of benefit to society. Um, and so, you know, the most important thing, of course, though, is the students that you teach and then the researchers that you train in the laboratory. I mean, in the end, a professor is a teacher uh, that has, you know, different hats to wear. Uh, but I think that, you know, we can teach our students, we can teach ourselves, 
And then hopefully we can sort of teach society and community the value, right, of this type of scientific exploration. Chris, I wonder if you are not only a user of cutting edge technology, but you're also a builder. If the kinds of things that you pursue require instrumentation that simply can't be purchased off the shelf. Yeah, so I would say that uh, we do things on the sort of uh, atomic molecular scale. And in some ways, you can think of chemists as atomic and molecular engineers. And so we really build things, not necessarily in the way that you would build a um, an instrument, but we're actually building things atom by atom, mole molecule by molecule. And that's the way we sort of view science. Um, and so even from the perspective of, say, you use a, a microscope that's commercially available, but the sort of probes that we develop basically enable you to create new types of experiments that couldn't be done if you were limited by what's commercially available. And so the hardware per se for us is the chemistry, the, the molecules that we, and the materials that we put together in the laboratory that create the experiments. How important is simulation in your research? And does that get you closer into AI and machine learning? Uh, that's a great question. So basically what we're getting into is sort of trying to use limited uh, data sets in order to sort of extrapolate uh, different types of trends. Uh, we have this project where we're looking at the effects of single atom marks on our proteome. And so if you think about a genetic code, genetic code is DNA, right? And then there's an epigenetic code that's not inherited that is environmentally controlled, right? on that DNA or RNA. And so that leads to making all of the proteins in, in your body as you go from DNA to RNA to protein as a central dogma. And so what we've been interested in is that are there additional marks on all of the proteins, your proteome within the body? And so we've been interested in single oxygen marks and the idea is that then we would like to be able to sort of interface that uh, with more sort of deep learning to understand what is the code uh, for that writing and erasing for those types of marks on our proteo. When you look at translational biology and therapies and, and drug discovery, coming from the periodic table perspective, as you've explained to me, are there deeper questions that combine cancer and neurodegeneration and metabolic disorders where you're taking a more holistic approach than a clinician specialist might. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So essentially, you know, it's a Goldilocks principle. You know, ele some elements you need the right amount. Too little is bad for you. Too much is bad for you. And that's why we want to study things, as I said, not a, just a molecular level, but to actually understand them at the atomic level. And so individual atoms, where they're attached to, in the proteome and does that give rise to sort of larger scale behavior at a cell level at a sort of tissue level and then moving on to sort of the whole living being and so i think taking that approach as opposed to picking a disease is what makes what we do different because the disease vulnerabilities the sort of druggable hot spots or the new types of diagnostics or therapeutics that will go towards that, like a precision medicine, are gonna be based on our elemental patterns. Like, can we sort of see this mosaic pattern of life and then pick out like a needle in a haystack, the sort of the, the vulnerabilities, sort of like pulling a thread on a sweater and watching it totally unravel. Although I guess that sounds like one of these 1990s Weezer songs <laughs> when I was a Caltech undergraduate. <laughs> Chris, I wonder if you could explain what metal signaling is and what you're able to do with this technique. Yeah, yeah. So basically, uh, metals are nutrients. They're more commonly known as minerals. If you talk to the layperson, so if you take a Flintstones vitamin, you see that there's iron, there's copper, there's zinc, there's magnesium. And to the layperson, those are called minerals, but to chemists, those are metals. Uh, and so we think about metals in a large scale, like you know, forging cars and buildings and airplanes, but uh, in every single one of the cells in our body, we require uh, a quota, a cocktail of these different types of metal elements. Now, typically the field thinks about these 
as interacting with either your DNA or RNA to sort of stabilize the three-dimensional structure or proteins or a metal will bind to protein and catalyze, right, that reaction of the protein. So it's sort of a gain of function. And so our sort of work is really kind of broken that narrow paradigm, because if you think about it again, from first principles, you bring a, elements together in a certain ratio, you can either sort of increase or decrease, right, function. You can increase or decrease fitness, if you think about it from a cellular perspective. And the element can bind anywhere in the linear or three-dimensional sequence. And so the concept that we've uh, come up with is metalloallosteric. So allosteric is a common biochemical term where you have something bind to a protein that's not at its active site. It's called an allosteric site because it's outside the active site. But something all the way out here can affect the active site and turn on or turn off its reactivity, just like a thermostat or a light switch that's not binary, but a light switch with that's sort of like a dimmer switch, right? So you have full control. And so we found that metals can do that. So metals can bind and either turn on or turn off the activity of a protein. It can make it stronger or weaker in terms of the phenotype that it can elicit in a cell. And then that has broader applications and implications for behavior. So for example, we've studied roles of copper as a signaling cofactor. Uh, that's an allosteric regulator. And we found it controls everything from sleep, uh, cycles of sleep, quality of sleep, uh, to your ability to process food and gain weight and burn fat, uh, to cancers, uh, the switch between whether a cancer would be a local cancer, a primary tumor, to one that metastasizes. And when it metastasizes, obviously that's, that's where it really is bad for you and that's the outcome. And so these single atoms, right, of nutrients that you would get out of a Flintstones vitamin bottle, uh, put in the right place or put in the wrong place on the right protein or the wrong protein, or too much on this protein A, but not enough on protein B, is sort of the code that we want to break and sort of decipher, kind of like a Rosetta Stone. If you could help untangle your work in activity-based sensing, what is the mm -hmm. activity and what are you sensing? Yeah, yeah. So this was another sort of concept that was actually the first project that we launched in the laboratory. And so, as I said, like this long-standing interest in studying atoms and really small molecules. Uh, one of the challenges that we came up with at the very beginning is we wanted to study extremely transient molecules that were at very low concentrations. These are called reactive oxygen species. And so each time you take a breath of air into your lungs, it gets distributed throughout your body, right? Your heart, arteries, and veins like pump the blood in and out uh, throughout your entire circulatory system. And it carries oxygen, right? Oxygen gives you energy to power the mitochondria in your body. Uh, the way it typically works is your body is a perfect fuel cell. So you breathe in oxygen and you burn that oxygen in your body and water is the only byproduct, which is a pretty good one if you're a living human being. But what happens sometimes is that your body is not perfect and you generate what are called reactive oxygen species where the oxygen gas isn't completely reduced to water and you release tiny amounts of these reactive oxygen species. And that's what we wanted to detect uh, because that's a, a source of what is called oxidative stress which can cause free radical damage. But at the same time, when we started our laboratory in 2004, there was a growing appreciation that this wasn't just a byproduct, right, of evolution, but it was something that actually could be used by the body in beneficial ways, kind of like fire, right? So uncontrolled fire is terrible, but fire that's well controlled can be used for cooking and heating. And so we wanted to detect these reactive oxygen species, but they're very, very transient. Sorry, so, <clears throat> so long story short is that these molecules are really small. And if we wanted to make a lock and key, like a handshake, it's very difficult. 
And so you want to have like the right size, the right shape. And so what we needed was a way to sort of capture these molecules. And what we decided to use, use catalysis to do so. So that's the activity that we're sensing. So the molecule sensed by its own catalytic activity. Chris, you mentioned proteomics. Of course, this is a well-developed field. It's an enormous field. What is the state of the art in early 2024? Yeah. What are the big questions? How are you pursuing those questions? Yeah, so I would say that um, there's two things. Um, you know, uh, detection in terms of proteomics, uh, the instrumentation and the techniques are getting better and better for taking smaller and smaller amounts of sample in order to detect protein. One big challenge, and I think it's akin to uh, the sort of the human genome project, is actually to do single molecule protein sequencing. And I think that's something that we and others in the field are really interested in pursuing. Um, and that will give rise to a proteome code, just like you would have a genetic code. And I think that's one of the biggest sort of outstanding questions. Now, beyond that, the interesting thing about proteins is that uh, proteins, we only have 20,000 genes in the human body or so that would give rise, say, to about 20,000 proteins. But it turns out that there are modifications on those proteins, kind of like what I talk about, the single molecule uh, modifications, but you have phosphorylation, glycosylation, putting sugars on, you have lipidation, um, you have methylation, and all of these modifications actually turn 20,000 proteins into millions of what are called proteoforms inside each and one of uh, every one of our cells. And so now you sort of understand that like it's a human genome project, but then the yeah. it's exponentially, right? When you go from four nucleic acid bases to 20 amino acids, and then each one of those amino acids can be modified in many, many ways, then it multiplies the problem to a huge scope, which I, which complexity is fascinating. I think that's, you know, uh, it is fascinating. And so the I would say the proteome code and going beyond the proteome code is one of the biggest challenges uh, in in the sort of area today. So that, that anticipated my question. You know, of course, the Human Genome Project got started just at the point when biology started to become really computational and there were computers powerful enough to deal with that amount of data. Here we are 25 years later. Is the computational power there to make a proteomic human project? Um, to be honest, I, I hesitate to say yet. I think what we do need is we do need deep learning because the, the amount of data that we have is so small. I think we're going to have to start with simple model organisms with fewer modifications and a smaller genome to begin with. And so just the way that you can, you know, do genomics on, you know, bacterial systems in parallel hundreds of organisms at a time. I think for a true proteome code, I think we're going to have to start at that before moving on to, I would say, a human proteome project, which I think should be something uh, that should be accelerated in the coming years. Okay, so that's sobering. You know, you're at Berkeley Lab. You see the very best <laughs> of what the U.S. government can throw at a problem in terms of computational power. I'm sure this is far afield from your own research, but I'm always interested at Caltech quantum information and quantum computers. Mm -hmm. There are these foundational questions about what a quantum computer will be good for. When that comes to pass, is this the kind of challenge in biology for which a quantum computational approach might be relevant? Uh, I, I, th I think that like it's got to be all hands on deck because the information, right, the amount of data is so huge. And so being able to essentially miniaturize, right, yeah, uh, and, and multiplex is going to be important. Uh, that's why I feel as if like the the AI and sort of machine learning will probably be a little bit ahead mm -hmm. because you can extrapolate mm -hmm. on limited data. And I think that this is basically where we are right now. We're just at the beginning of this frontier of a, of a true proteome code. And I think that that's the uh, sort of the next step. You know, for us is to see if we can extrapolate what little data we have 
uh, to sort of make those leaps and bounds. Okay, so I don't want to make it, you know, you said it almost as a throwaway, proteomic code and beyond. What What is the beyond? What does that look like? Yeah, so I mean, I think the thing is, when you think about a sort of genetic code, uh, you don't think about it just as a, like your sort of genetics, which lead to, uh, you know, inherited traits. But the proteome code and genetic code getting down to sort of single cell level is another sort of direction uh, for the field, because as we evolve, right, to more and more complex organisms, uh, each cell is specialized, right? And so each cell is then has its own uh, sort of fitness tested all the time. And so even from the genetic code, it's not so simple. It actually, you do have to end up going from the genetic code to the single cell genetic code. <laughs> and that's another sort of huge sort of direction on another axis. And so if you think about the proteome code, which I just told you is going to be much larger, then that one also has to be brought at some point down to the single cell level. Is this to say, you know, not to get way too far ahead of ourselves, but where there's a certain level of frustration in how much there is to do in understanding Alzheimer's, in cancer therapies, is the proteomic code, is the idea that this really is going to unlock answers that are certainly not available to us now? Yeah, yeah, but I actually view it more in an optimistic way. I mean, I think that's what makes science so exciting is that you you do want to do something that no one has done before or, or observe something that no one has observed before. And since technology is always moving forward at such a rapid pace, I, I think that there, there are huge opportunities for, for our generation and the next generation to get involved. And so uh, the, the great part about you know, science and, and at least for academics that do open publishing, uh, you, you can read about what's going on anywhere across the world at any time uh, from your sort of your desktop. Whereas before, I think, before the digital age, it really was very slow for information to get disseminated. Chris, your work on artificial photosynthesis, of course, one of the key problems there is scaling. So where yeah. for you is it an interesting laboratory question? And where do we make this so that's a technology that really helps on a global scale? Yeah, so I guess my... My sort of philosophy on it is uh, dis distribution. And I think we want to think about it not in the way that the industrialized world thinks about it, but a distributed energy. Because there are many sorts of parts of the world that don't have the same sort of infrastructure. And so can you run small household appliances, right? Can you run things like getting enough clean water uh, to wash your clothes or cook your food? Uh, can you sort of heat your home? Um, and so I think that those are the sorts of scales. Uh, it's about distribution, not s necessarily scale in terms of something very large for these types of devices now and in the future. Well, Chris, let's go back. Let's establish some personal history. How did you yep. hear about Caltech? Why did you choose Caltech? Yeah, that's a great, great question. I, you know, so I grew up, I was born and raised in the Midwest. And so I was born in Iowa. We moved to Indiana when I was two. And so basically I grew up in a cornfield <laughs> or right behind a cornfield. And so I would say a place like Caltech was, uh, was really, really far away. How did your family get to the Midwest? Yeah, so uh, basically, uh, you know, parents uh, immigrated from uh, Hong Kong via China. Uh, and this was like the late 60s. And so they settled in Wisconsin. And so parents met in La Crosse, Wisconsin and got married. <laughs> um, you know, uh, my, my dad was a, a, a student at Iowa State. And so I was born in Ames. And then, you know, family got jobs. We moved to Indiana um, and, you know, basically sort of grew up in a, in a really, really small town. I mean, the joke was that uh, we didn't have a street address for the first 10, 12 years of my life. It was, uh, they just said Chang family rural route six and it got to us, the mail, <laughs> sort of like the Pony Express. And um, 
So uh, I moved, uh, we moved uh, to California. Um, I actually, my, my dad passed away when I was in high school. So we moved to be closer to family in California. So we actually moved to the Bay Area. Um, and so I, I tagged along with a friend um, that was going on college visits. Uh, so his dad was a legacy at MIT. And so he wanted to visit MIT and Caltech. And so we actually took a road trip down to Southern California and I would say the first time I saw this place, I was like, this, this is really amazing. <laughs> I was like, it's so, it was really idyllic and, and people, um, you know, were, were sort of happy uh, and, you know, just doing all sorts of interesting things. So I ended up applying um, and it came down to a choice between coming to Berkeley as an undergraduate or going to Caltech. And I have to be honest, it was the financial aid. Like a, I, I got an, enough financial aid at Caltech that it was actually cheaper oh, with wow. the work study and I was able to go. And I just, you know, it was a coin flip because I, I you know, even though I'm a professor at Berkeley, I, I could have actually been a Berkeley undergraduate and it was just sort of fate. Um, and two totally different types of places. But I would say once I first stepped on campus, it was um, it was definitely the, the place to be for me. And you arrived in, was it 93? Yep, fall of 93. Yep. And what were your interests at that point? What did you want to pursue? Yeah. So, you know, so that's why it's sort of the third time's a charm. Um, so I was not a chemistry major. <laughs> Actually came, like most Caltech undergrads, was to engineering. Uh -huh. And so we went through a couple of engineering majors that didn't quite stick uh, until getting into chemistry. Uh, it was it was actually two things. So the first thing was the old, uh, at that time, the old Mead labs, the undergraduate teaching labs. You know, one of the laboratories was to make the original uh, inorganic coordination compounds, or they're called Werner compounds. Uh, and so you get these beautiful purple and yellow and orange sorts of solids that, you know, you sort of, you're cooking them, and then you see these different, totally different colors. And it's just a question of like, rearrange the same atoms and how they're bound to the metal. And I was like, wow, that's, that's really neat that I can see it with my eye, but know the invisible sort of code for why it makes the color that it makes. And so then I took a, a class by John Burkaw. I think Burkaw's recently retired. Yeah. This is famous Chem 112 class. And, mm -hmm. and he, you know, was a fantastic teacher and really just explained why we were seeing what we were seeing in the real world. And, and I really got hooked on chemistry. It's sort of seeing the invisible, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, um, and so then I got, uh, I basically asked everybody in the department for a research position and got rejected from everybody, <laughs> except for Harry Gray. <laughs> so of course it's like, you know, you're, you're this kid, you're knocking on professor's doors at the time, like, oh, do you have room for an undergraduate? And so I had the Chicago Cubs hat on. Uh -huh. And so, uh, uh, you know, growing up in the Midwest, that was like, you know, a team I had followed. Um, and so Harry told me to come back the next day, but each day he told me to come back five minutes earlier. <laughs> and I think that he maybe was trying to get rid of me at the time, but I just kept coming back. And then finally, I think it was like the third time he says, oh yeah, you're, you're in like going, you know, he's, he's just, you know, you, you know, Harry, he's just incredible. Yeah. So um, so yeah, so then I, then I started research with Harry, um, and worked with his lab the rest of my undergraduate days there. What, what was the Gray Lab doing at that point? Yeah, so the Gray Lab was very much, um, you know, full force into energy science and looking at how electrons, electricity moves in proteins. And at the time, the, one of the big projects was how that influences how a protein folds. And so there's energy conversion and then how that energy uh, is manifested into this three-dimensional structure of proteins. Uh, but it turns out that I actually had a very retro project. And so I, I actually worked personally with Harry on a, on a project, which was essentially his first project as a, as a postdoc back when he was uh, in Copenhagen uh, back in the early 60s. Um, and so we were just, uh, because I liked colors, uh, we worked on these beautiful green colored emerald compounds that had uh, multiple bonds between them. 
And so Harry is one of his first famous papers in the first issue of Inorganic Chemistry back in 1962 was the electronic structure of vanadium attached to oxygen, a vanadiol species, and the bonding behind that. And that basically was the launch of what is now called ligand field theory, mm -hmm. um, a, a type of molecular orbital theory that has to do with metals and how they bind to other atoms and elements. And so we worked on the manganese nitride or manganese nitrogen bonded analog um, and yeah, published some papers and um, really learned chemistry from the best uh, going all the way back to his work in the early 60s. This is a Caltech undergraduate doing real research in a real lab. Exactly. Yeah. And so, you know, with the class being so small, we only had, I think, 10 undergraduate majors in my year. So the chem club was much smaller <laughs> uh, back then, I would say. Um, and so that was really formative. Uh, you know, at, you know, at Caltech, you, there are lots of classes. People have to take so many classes and the, the homework sets are long the infinite time for exams. <laughs> um, basically, professors are like, go ahead, <laughs> try to answer these questions. And I think it sort of really promoted the ability to sort of think uh, outside the box. And research really resonated with me much more than the problem sets did. Chris, on the social side, what house did you live in and what kinds of activities were you involved in? Oh, yeah. So I was at Page House as an undergraduate. Uh, to be honest, it was a Kind of at the time known for a lot of drinking. <laughs> the party house. Uh, it's a part. It was a party house at the time, but I think you know people still did their homework and and worked pretty hard, uh, but had a great time. You know, uh, played uh, played on the Caltech basketball team. I, uh, you know, work uh, did some work in the library, the Millican Library. I guess I guess that's going to be renamed at some point. It already is Caltech Hall. <laughs> so so I guess like strike that from any sort of. Uh, <laughs> uh, like thing and writing in a transcript. Um, but yeah, no, it was a, it was a great, it was a great group of people. Um, you know, the house system I think is unique, uh, to Caltech and it really builds bonds. Um, and so this, this sort of almost like a Harry Potter sorting hat type of week that occurs, uh, was really great. And so I felt like I found the right home or house, you know, for me and, uh, you know, really enjoyed my time and made a lot of friends. Chris, and more yeah, actually, one of the last times I went to Caltech was, a long time ago, but it was for a wedding at the AF for a uh, for classmate. One of the best places to get married, <laughs> for sure, for sure. Chris, a more yeah. personal question. You know, growing up in the Midwest, you have a flat American accent. Coming to California, did that reconnect you with your Asian background at all? Did you think about those things? Yeah, actually, uh, I did. I did. It, it was interesting because, uh, and I, I actually even wrote it in my college essay at the time um, because. Uh, now we sort of come full circle of the way the world is right now. Um, and we like to think that people aren't othered, but they, but they still are. Sure. Um, so we grew up in a place where I found out early on that there is no such thing as racism with a singularity. Sure. Racism really only occurs with a minority because the singularity is not threatening enough mm -hmm. to sort of upend or change the order of things. Yeah. And so, you know, I, we grew up as the only Asian family anywhere around at all, um, and was a very sort of homogeneous population. But I actually faced relatively little racism as a as a kid, unless we were sort of traveling with the baseball team to other towns. That was worse then. Uh, but everybody is such a small town; everybody knows each other, so they can actually see each other as people. And obviously, as I said, being a singularity, you know, that's you know the that's non-threatening. So moving to California was really interesting because on the outside, I look like a lot of people in California. In fact, actually, my accent has grown to be more Californian over the years. I used to have actually a pretty strong twang uh -huh. growing up in the Midwest. And so you sort of look like everybody, but at the same time, you're like a totally Midwestern type of upbringing, which is very, very different yeah. than, than California. Um, and so that was sort of an interesting experience being at a place like Caltech, because now you you go to college and people are coming from all over the world. And it really, even though it was a small place, I think it was the right uh, sort of fit. Um, if I had gone to a place like Berkeley, it almost would have been like a sensory overload. <laughs> yeah, I would say. 
uh, for myself, my own sort of personal uh, growth over time. But it is interesting that it was something that I realized pretty early on. As you were nearing graduation, you know, recognizing the value of chemistry and in industry, for example, did you ever think about going for a job? Were you always on the academic graduate school path? Oh, so, um, so I did want to go to graduate school. I didn't know what I wanted to do after that. And so uh, like a lot of Caltech undergrads, I kind of sort of hinted at it. It's like we had to work really, really hard, right? Mm -hmm. And so I was ready for a break. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I took a gap year before starting graduate school. So I applied and was accepted. I, I got to do a Fulbright scholarship in France, Strasbourg, France for a year. And uh, I had never been to Europe before. And so it was just a big leap. And I guess in the end, like, like a lot of things, there's not a great reason. It was just a feeling of like wanting to see beyond, uh, you know, where we were at the time. And so I'd moved from the Midwest to California, might as well see a different part of the world. Um, and so then it turned out that I guess, what was it, maybe 15 years later, uh, the, the mentor, the professor that I had won a Nobel Prize. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, it was Jean-Pierre Sauvage. Um, and he was just the nicest guy. Um, this is this is like kind of the World Cup year, 1998. You know, he picks me up from the airport with his wife, drives me home. Uh, the, the laboratory had already rented me this flat overlooking the cathedral. And so I just, you know, lived there did some chemistry, traveled Europe during the weekends, um, watched some of the France sort of early stages in the World Cup uh, at the beginning of summer, and then started graduate school. And so that's part of the reason why, you know, I wanted to try a different part of the country. And so we, we went to, you know, I chose MIT, so went to Boston. <laughs> And, and was there uh, for graduate studies. Now, did you defer admission or you applied to grad school while you were in France? No, no, I deferred admission. So because I didn't know whether I was going to get the study abroad program. Uh -huh. uh, so I applied to both at the same time and deferred admission. Were you already thinking about the interface of chemistry and biology? Was that sort of a starting point for you at MIT? Yeah, yeah. So I, I would say that it it actually started in Harry's group at Caltech. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I think that, you know, Harry is, is so steeped in fundamentals of chemistry and, and really such a wonderful teacher that I felt that chemistry doesn't have to be put in a very narrow box. And so at Caltech, you have a lot of people that um, are polymaths. They're really good at a lot of different things. And then there are other people that are like extremely good <laughs> at one thing, um, especially the people who do math. <laughs> um, and so uh, it was just something that I was interested in. Um, and so just going to, to France, I already had basically two different types of research experiences before showing up to graduate school. And so graduate school, I was actually very interested in energy science uh, way before it became sort of popular. I mean, I think in the in the late 90s, gas was still probably like 64 cents a gallon. Yeah. Uh, but I thought at that time, it was just really interesting, you know, to sort of think about sustainability. And so that's why I actually chose my the PhD advisor that I had at MIT, who has Caltech ties. As, it was Dan Nocera. Oh, yes. Yeah. Who was, who was Harry, one of Harry's uh, uh, graduate students in the early 80s. And so it was sort of full circle with that. Um, I saw Dan give a talk and was just, you know, blown away and was like, oh, I want to I want to work on energy science for for my Ph.D. And that's what we ended up doing. We did a fuel cell re research and then sort of bio inspired type of catalysts mimicking uh, enzyme active sites uh, for looking at oxygen consumption. Um, and so that was. You know, that was a, for me, it was a great experience. And, and Boston, obviously, is a wonderful place for students. There's just so much uh, young, young people energy in the town. Tell me about Dan's style as a mentor. How was he in guiding your dissertation? Well, Dan, Dan is pretty hands off. He, he lets people kind of run with um, their own sort of ideas and passions. Uh, but he's extremely supportive. I think that, you know, he, you know, he always... He, you know, he was always there um, to sort of help discuss big picture ideas and resources were never a question. Um, and so therefore it's like anything that you needed, uh, he would, you know, try to provide. 
uh, for the sort of crazy ideas that we were trying. Now, it's a different stage in your life. You're a graduate student, not an undergraduate. How would you compare, though, the research culture at MIT based on what you saw at Caltech? Uh, so research cultures change uh, over the years. Uh, I would say the Caltech culture was much more collaborative than the MIT culture, at least at the time. So I don't want to make it sound of negative course. on my alma mater. Um, but I think at Caltech, I went from a place where like everybody knew each other and everybody like by sight. Um, whereas MIT is, is a bigger place in a bigger town. And I think uh, it was much more engineering dominated. Mm -hmm. Whereas Caltech, I think, has a, a, a much more of a balance between science and engineering. Um, and so uh, it was a it was sort of a yeah, it was a different experience, but but still like. You know, it was it was an awesome place to do research. Now you emphasized you emphasized your interest in sustainability and sustainability and energy issues. Did you also keep up on the biology side of things in graduate school? Yeah, yeah. So basically, just by the literature and the seminars. So we didn't do I didn't do anything that was biological in my PhD. I really did pretty hardcore chemistry, uh, sustainable catalysis. Um, and so uh, I met my, my wife, Michelle, at MIT. We were, we were grad students together. Um, and so then when it came time to, to think about a next step, um, I was thinking about a postdoc. <laughs> um, and so uh, because we were getting married, uh, we wanted to obviously stay in the same place. And so I, I applied to Steve Lippard's lab at MIT for a postdoc. So at that time, we're basically doing all the wrong things for a two body <laughs> career. Like you're not supposed to get training, grad school, postdoc at the same institution in the same department. You're not supposed to like, you know, um, take those considerations, husband and wife living in the same place. You're supposed to kind of get your records and resumes to a certain stage and then go on the open market. Uh, but I think that for us, like, you know, we chose life first. And uh, science gives you opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and so so that's when I really went back, I would say, into a more, um, you know, Steve Lippard, bioinorganic chemistry. They're sort of synonymous. Um, he's most famous for uh, the anti-cancer drugs that are based on platinum that are like testicular or ovarian cancer. He kind of identified and elucidated all the mechanisms of action and how they serve as DNA damaging agents. Mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the way that they work. Um, like 95% of all testicular cancers are now cured and they're all platinum drugs. Wow. It's a huge success, right? So if, if other cancers could be like that, then um, in terms of that efficacy of treatment would be great. Um, but yeah, no, but he, he actually uh, was interested in chemistry in the brain as well. And so I, I got a taste of it in, in, a sh in my short time in his laboratory because he was studying a zinc as a calcium surrogate. And so calcium signaling is very abundant in, uh, in cells in the brain as well as in your heart um, for transmitting information. Uh, but certain cell types in the brain had a lot of zinc in them. And so we studied some of those processes. All of the, the the great hospitals in Boston, mm -hmm. was that an asset for you as a postdoc? So I didn't spend enough time as a postdoc in order to really sort of uh, interface with a lot of hospital researchers uh, because the imaging that we were doing was more cell-based imaging. Um, and then I think future people in the laboratory went more towards the you know translational imaging like MRI or PET. Uh, and so we've been able to do that in my own independent faculty career. But as a postdoc, it was just too short a time uh, to kind of uh, take advantage of those opportunities. What about biotech? Was Cambridge already becoming a hub at that point? Very, it was very, very, very early days. I mean, if you go back to like Third Street and Binney, uh, there was there was almost nothing except for the Marriott Hotel at the time. <laughs> and then uh, Biogen was just getting up and going. But there was almost nothing at that time. And now it's just, uh, it's amazing to have watched it grow. Yeah, it was still like the Novartis uh, was still the Neko factory at the time. Oh, my goodness. Like the Neko wafers. So um, and this is only like 20 some years ago. It's amazing. Exactly. 
Exactly, exactly, exactly. Chris, the duality of your time at MIT, having both the energy and now thinking more about biology and translation, when it came time to go on the job market, what positions did you think about applying for? What what was most exciting to you and how would you market yourself? Yeah, so, um, you know, actually, I, it, it was something where I, I wanted to do something of both, mm-hmm. right? And, you know, and I sort of thought that, well, I guess technically the closest thing that I could be hired as, as an inner would be an, as an inorganic chemist. And so I sort of self-identified as inorganic chemistry, uh, but then the proposals are, are definitely something that was a bit out of the box at that time. And so we had proposals in both areas, really, really wanting to understand, you know, metals in biological systems, as well as using elements, you know, for sustainability and, and, catalyzing um, artificial photosynthesis. Where would you apply? What was compelling to you? Where? <laughs> yeah, so actually, uh, I, it, it, it's, I'm not sure if this should go on a transcript, but basically, like, I was asked to apply to two places, uh, Caltech and Berkeley. So uh, when professors from both institutions came to give seminars, when I was still a graduate student, they basically asked me to send in an application. So I only applied to two schools. And then I, I flew back here to, to do two interviews and and I did not get the Caltech offer and I got the Berkeley offer. So okay. it was like the, the the opposite of, and so then An I took the offer. For you. I, easy decision, I took the offer that I got. Um, probably if I gotten the Caltech offer, I would have definitely gone to Caltech. And it sort of okay. completed the circle from the choice that you faced as an undergraduate. Yep. Yeah. 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 So it, yeah. So it worked out really well. And obviously, you know, uh, you know, when you hire people, like it's the right fit for the department at the time, but, uh, but I got really lucky. I, I think it's really stressful to apply for a job and I kind of almost didn't have to <laughs> like do a full search. So nowadays, so, yeah, the buzzword is interdisciplinarity. As right. a junior faculty member at Berkeley, if not the name, was that sentiment already well established? Were you in good yes. shape in terms of what you wanted to pursue? Yeah, so it turned out to be the perfect fit. Uh, you know, the great thing about Berkeley is that it is a big, big school. And what it means is that, especially if you're doing interdisciplinary science, um, I had so much support. Um, I still have support, but like early on, it was really important to talk to, you know, collaborators in neurobiology, you know, collaborators in material science up at LBL. Um, and then just the breadth of the department, you know, the people at the time when I was hired, it was this uh, huge, huge um, hiring sort of spree mm-hmm. uh, by Berkeley in the sort of the early to mid 2000s because it's it's kind of like the baby boomer age, and so at that time I think we had like ten or eleven assistant professors, and so uh, it's a big department, but we had like turned over the faculty by almost twenty five percent in my sort of pre-tenure days. And I think that sort of energy and excitement, everybody coming in with new ideas and new sort of directions, uh, but everybody being really complimentary in terms of the areas of expertise was was really exciting. I would say it was a, it was a golden era for, for the department at that time. You know, budget-wise now, you can't hire that many people. Yeah, yeah. Chris, tell me about setting up your lab. Let's start with the instrumentation. What was most important for you? <laughs> the most important thing was space. Uh, yeah. We only had about 800 square feet of space. Uh, we had to fit uh, glove boxes, fluorescence instruments. Uh, we we didn't have room for the microscopes that we needed at the time, so we had to use uh, campus facilities. Um, and so it was just about packing in the people. <laughs> uh, and so the the main thing about setting up the lab is it's not the equipment, it's the people. And for me, that was the the key. And so we kind of outgrew our lab quite quickly uh, because of the great people we were able to recruit. Actually, one of my first students uh, in the first year is now my current colleague, Evan Miller, in our department. And so if you're getting Berkeley quality faculty (laughs) in your first class of students, then, then I think that makes your job a lot easier. So I think we, in the first uh, four years, uh, I think 
I want to say something like eight or nine of those students are now running their own laboratories. It was something like 80% of the students like went on to become professors from that sort of initial time because they were just interested in in science and then they saw how exciting it could be and they wanted to lead their own teams. To go back to the translational societal impact, you know, the early 2000s now climate change is becoming a significant concern. The Bay Area is becoming a biotech hub. How did mm -hmm. you, you mentioned this is right at the beginning of your faculty career. How did you balance those, 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 those dual interests in basic science and translational research? Yeah, that's a great question. So I would say that uh, I'll be honest, like uh, it may or may not have been the right thing to do, but I kind of siloed them. Uh huh. So for the energy science, we really uh, leveraged our Lawrence Berkeley National Lab appointment. Mm -hmm. And I think that we really wanted to focus on basic science because that was funded by the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, for the past two decades, I think we've really focused on fundamental questions without thinking about the, I guess, the device that one would put it in. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's born fruit. Uh, large scale programs, you know, have been launched at, at LBL. Um, it's one of the joint ones was the sort of the JCAP, LISA types of programs. But there are ongoing programs at Berkeley the entire time. So you didn't necessarily need to be part of a hub in order to sort of access that environment. Then in terms of the sort of the chemical biology research, we've always been, uh, you know, supported both by the federal government, NIH, and then that was supplemented uh, with other support from, you know, Howard Hughes Medical Institute over the years, but lots of local industry and biotech. And so everywhere from, you know, Agilent to Merck, to Genentech have all sort of provided support, you know, over the years in that type of ecosystem. So we're sort of like in two different worlds, so to speak, that didn't, you know, uh, match per se, but, but it all still worked because the students in the laboratory kind of choose your own adventure, which direction do you want to go into? Would students come to work with you thinking that they could go between the two, even if you had them siloed, it's still one professor, it's still one lab. Yeah, so uh, so when I mean by siloed, it was really more the, um, the I guess I would say the, the people that I interacted with, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like people from Genentech would never come up to Lawrence Berkeley Lab and give a seminar, for example. Uh, but the students actually all worked together. And so there were several students that, that went back and forth that switched uh, depending on their project interest and and what they wanted to do afterwards. You talked about, you know, at Caltech, there's polymaths and there's people who are really good at hyper specializing. I'm always interested in the politics, the culture of tenure and what to emphasize and when when it's about breadth and what it's about depth. How did you manage all of those things when your time came up? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, I, I would say that it's not... Um, you shouldn't have a strategy for that. You should do, you should be the best version of yourself. Mm -hmm. That's always the advice that I give. Mm -hmm. And so if you're interested, um, they call it uh, a fox versus a hedgehog, right? And so foxes can do a lot of things quickly. A hedgehog kind of digs, digs, digs in. And so both are valuable in science. And one is not more uh, important than the other in terms of pushing you know, the entire field or fields forward. And so for, for tenure, I think my experience is, uh, for my own self is that I was always encouraged just to do what I thought was the most interesting. And as we moved forward at Berkeley, uh, I've seen successful tenure cases be either a polymath or someone who sticks with one topic. How does this affect the chronology, the various appointments that you have? I, I meant to ask at the beginning, did yeah, your professorship yeah. in molecular and cell biology, was that from the beginning or that came later on? So that came later on. So at the very beginning, I was a chemistry professor as well as a faculty scientist at, at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And then I got the neuroscience appointment uh, after that. And then after that uh, was... Uh, 
UCSF, and then after that was molecular and cell biology. Okay. What was the carryover research from MIT that got you into neuroscience at Berkeley? Yeah, so as I said, um, I think, you know, really sort of uh, looking at zinc uh, as a calcium surrogate uh, was an interesting question. It, it did teach me how to do cell culture mm -hmm. um, and microscopy. And so those were technical skills that I were able to bring uh, to the lab as an assistant professor. But really then it led me to more reading. And so the one of the original proposals of the laboratory, which is basically what we're still working on, is this question of the elements of life. And so it turns out that the human brain has more elements at higher concentrations than any other part of your body, right? So it's just a very simple fact. And the question is why and how does that work? The, the, the emphasis on metals and thinking about neurodegenerative diseases. So, you know, it's very fascinating because as we're told repeatedly, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are not inevitable results of aging, and yet right. they're, they're concentrated in the elderly. How do you right. unravel that from your perspective? So what I would say is that aging is a risk factor for disease, and it has to do with cell viability and cell fitness. And so the way that we view things these days is, and that's why I said we're pretty disease agnostic in the way that we approach problems, mm -hmm is because in neurodegeneration, you want to keep the cells alive and growing. In cancer, you want the opposite. <laughs> you don't want those cells to grow and divide. And so finding out like what causes something to live and die at that level it, and how it sort of interfaces with its neighboring cells is kind of the, the first stage to understanding atomic molecular basis of disease. So the great thing about metals is that, you know, although the actual concentrations are relatively small, everything that metals do are amplified, right? It's like uh, that sort of uh, e pluribus unum, like out of, right, many, you know, out of one comes many. And so one metal can actually sort of amplify and turn over and catalyze many, many reactions in parallel. And I think that that, uh, that we feel like from uh, first principles is a good place to start because everything you study is not a one-to-one -one correspondence. It could be a one to a hundred, one to a thousand, one to a million sort of amplification. And so I think that there are, there are great opportunities, you know, to study some elements that will be able to sort of amplify function in that way. Is neuroscience your entree to the adjunct professorship at UCSF? Uh, no, actually it was just, um, you know, interested in, uh, imaging. And so we, we talked to people in radiology. Um, and so we, we started collaborations to, as I said, translate mm -hmm. some of our imaging technologies that we were doing for cell-based imaging over the first five years or so, uh, my career at Berkeley, and then taking those to pet imaging, radio imaging that you could do in and mouse models, and then hopefully to people. Uh, we've also done some MRI over the years of making new types of functional MRI contrast agents as well. Um, so that was the first direction. And then it grew into our work in uh, hemoproteomics and drug discovery and some strong collaborations with researchers over at UCSF on that front. Chris, a funding question. The affiliation with Berkeley Lab does that provide or does that optimize DOE funding for you? Yeah. Yeah, like me and, and many other people. It basically is a core program that is funded directly by the U.S. government, you know, for doing a national lab research. Yes. And then for the health research, are you more of like a, I don't know what the right word is, a civilian? You're not, you don't have that inside exactly. connection like you exactly. would at Berkeley Lab. Exactly. Yep. And so a combination of federal funding, industry support, philanthropy. Um, and so it's a, sort of a broad base. That's a great, you know, opportunity to reflect on. You mentioned the three, you know, this, this is what they are. There's the philanthropy, there's industry, there's government. What does each do well in terms of their motivations, in terms of their timescale, even their patients, 
even their expectations? Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, you know, federal, federal funding is, is important because uh, that is something that's sustainable. And there are, um, you know, sort of, it's create, it's not just creation of knowledge, but also federal funding, uh, there's a support uh, for training the next generation of, of scientists. And so the National Institutes of Health, they want to talk about you know, increasing participation in the biomedical workforce. And there are many, many different types of career paths that will contribute positively. I think it's something like for every dollar that you put into the NIH, the economy gets $8 back, right? The type of work that we're doing. And so when you think about taxpayer money going to that, there's nothing that will give you an eight to one ratio of return. Right. right. And so I think that that's a really important part but because the government moves so slowly, that's where philanthropy really helps. And so, you know, but there are only so many people that have the means to be able to support uh, science, research, technology in that way. Um, and so it's not as widely available, I would say, but it has the advantages of uh, speed, focus, and, and flexibility, right? Because it's, it's not this large governmental operation. Then the third sort of pillar is industry. And so industry really is where you translate uh, things to products. And it's twofold in my opinion, because the products are the, the actual sort of say, if it's a pharmaceutical company, it's medicines, but the products are also the people that we train. And so uh, close connections do help students get internships, permanent jobs, exposure to different career paths. That is extremely useful to them because not all students are going to become professors. That's one career path. But I think that that's the reason why I, my personal philosophy is not just you want to raise as much money just because you want more money, but actually having these different sources gives you uh, the broadest sort of viewpoint on, on who are the stakeholders for science and who benefits from science. Chris, the two areas, translational biology and energy sustainability, very right for startups, lots of ideas to translate into mm -hmm. companies. Have you ever gone down that path? Have you ever considered those opportunities? Um, consider those opportunities, but uh, we we haven't really gone in that way. I, 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 I'm much more of, as I would say, an academic and a teacher, uh, but we've had, uh, we have a lot of intellectual property that we've generated uh, that's been licensed. And, um, you know, so some of our reagents are sold as commercial products. Um, others have been brought into research programs in different industry uh, to help facilitate internal projects. Um, and there have been, um, you know, I would say, yeah, there's there's been reasonable sort of monetary value for that IP. Uh, but I myself haven't really founded any companies. Most of the students and postdocs in the laboratory have not gone down sort of entrepreneurial path. Um, they, uh, I would say, so it's really driven by the people that have been trained. Is that more of a bandwidth issue on your part, or you really don't have much interest in business yourself? Uh, no, no, actually, it's for right now, it's, it's definitely a bandwidth issue. <laughs> and um, that's not going to get any better, probably. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, you, you never know. With, with the move, uh, bandwidth changes, right? Yeah. So I would never say never to anything, but for now, I think it's a pretty full-time job. You know, it's a big undergraduate institution, lots of teaching, uh, lots of service for such a large organization, you know, in addition to the research that we're doing. So we'll see the big public school uh, and the small private school. Um, we'll compare and contrast and do the experiment. Chris, you mentioned teaching. This is something that you've been recognized for, your commitment to teaching, to mentorship. Let's go first on the undergraduate side. What are the most meaningful classes for you to teach undergraduates? Oh, yeah, yeah. So it was great timing for me because when I arrived at Berkeley, they basically launched the chemical biology undergraduate major. Mm -hmm. It was the first in the country. And so Berkeley being a flagship public institution, as well as one with a really large population, we kind of hit the ground running. So what I did is I designed a course from scratch. Uh, that was the inorganic chemistry requirement for that major. And that's been my favorite class to teach over the years. And so that that's something where, you know, there have been you know, thousands of students that have gone through that, 
that course. And it's been really rewarding. I mean, I also teach organic chemistry laboratory courses mainly. I've done some biochemistry. And for graduate courses, it's more specialized topics um, that I've taught inorganic spectroscopy, bioinorganic chemistry, metal signaling, uh, redox biology, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So um, a lot of a lot of courses over the years. When you're a professor for 20 years, you don't want to teach the same thing every that's year. Right. That's right. So it really, uh, we need to recharge as well. I can't help but ask launching the chemical biology program for undergraduates. Where is Pete Schultz in this story? Yeah, so uh, so this was uh, really post Schultz. Uh huh. Um, and so it it really started, I would say, more with uh, Carolyn Bertozzi and Michael Marletta mm -hmm. uh, with graduate education, and then it was sort of a collective uh, of, of different people. Pete is definitely one of my heroes. He uh, you know, one of the early people in chemical biology, and then really sort of, ex you know, this expanded genetic code, I think, you know, we knew him, you know, he was famous when we were undergraduates, right, because he was a, you know, a Caltech product as well. Um, but it, it's sort of like, I think that was probably like, like eight years later, or something, the chemical biology major, as opposed to when he was at, at Berkeley. And then on the so under overlapped. And yeah, on the never... undergraduate side, you know, we, we were talking about the rise of computational biology. These are now students who, who grew up with computers. They're so, you know, they have such great facility with, with computers and algorithms. How does that change what they're interested in, what they want to pursue for careers? Yeah, so I think that uh, what, it, what it comes down to is, is data, right? They're, they're much better at handling large amounts of data but they're also better at extrapolating uh, from limited experimental data to, to make models. And so I think that, uh, you know, the great part about research is that it used to take so long to do certain experiments, but now, especially with imaging proteomics, you're getting large amounts of data. You know, you can get much more out of the analysis uh, through computational power than you ever could before. Before we were getting binary answers, yes, no, go, no, go. But now you're actually starting to see, I would say, mosaic patterns and it's things that we can't physically see. But if you know how to use right computation, uh, then things start to make sense. In the way that Harry Gray provided this incredible opportunity for you, are undergraduates knocking on your door? Are you making sure to make room for them yeah. in your lab? Yeah, no, it's been a it, it, it's been an important um, sort of aspect. So we've had almost a hundred undergraduates uh, research experiences with another probably another fifty, almost fifty visiting scholars from all over the world. And so I think providing that opportunity, that that sort of first taste of open-ended research and science is very, you know, personally important to me because as I sort of said, it's like, it just takes one person to give you a chance. Um, the great part about Berkeley is that there are just so many talented undergraduates. Uh, we're, we're usually just oversubscribed, right? Because you do have to provide the mentoring environment for them. And so you wanna provide as many as you can in terms of spots, but they still have to be quality spots mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for them to get you know, um, a layered mentoring experience. You're saying it does no one any favors by just accepting one, somebody and not giving them anything to work with. Yes. Chris, graduate side, 20 years of graduate students from your very first to who you have now, who's coming with you to Princeton. Just some overall questions about what has changed and what has stayed the same from the kinds of programs, undergraduate programs your graduate students are coming from their skills, the kinds of jobs that they want to take, the kinds of jobs that are available to them upon graduating. What's changed? What's been constant over the years? Uh, I guess I would say the, the thing that's been constant is that, you know, there's just so much talent and passion for, for doing great science. And I think that's something that's been uh, reinvigorating year after year. I think that's one thing that I didn't quite appreciate when I was starting out because you're not much older than a graduate student when you're a young professor and you think in some ways it's going to last forever. Yeah. But you do get renewed uh, where you have people coming and going. Um, 
I like to say that uh, professors are basically the worst business people because basically we, we make no money because whatever we bring in, we spend it all if we're doing research efficiently and we have zero employee retention if it works out, <laughs> right? And so like what sort of position is not making any money with zero employee retention? But I think the products that are produced are the people, yeah. right? Yeah. And I think that, um, you know, so that's been constant. I think, uh, you know, at these great institutions, you always have, you know, young, excited people and you're just at this early career stage. So I think that's been the same. I think what's been different is that students are much more sophisticated than they used to be. And the, the speed of information, you know, especially, uh, you know, the, the ability of students to, to communicate with each other, it's so much faster. Uh, and so therefore they, they see the world in a bigger sort of place. And so they know more about the career paths uh, that they can take. And I, I find them to be in general uh, more sophisticated and, and focused on the next step, as opposed to, I think that when I was first starting, there was very little talk of what do you want to do after your PhD? For me, I was like, I don't know. I, I just like science and I'm going to do this. I want to take this one step at a time. So it can be a double-edged sword. You know, planning ahead is good, but sometimes you want to be in the moment. And well, I think it's that the information and decision fatigue is real, where there's just a lot more input of information um, that students have now that they have to deal with. Your appointment at Berkeley Lab ha is becoming a staff scientist in a national laboratory. Is that a viable option for graduate students coming out of your, your oh, lab? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it's a great option. And many of them want to do it. And so if you live in a place like the Bay Area, the Bay Area itself becomes an ecosystem of, of tons and tons of different jobs. And so a very prized one will be to be a staff scientist at the National Lab. It's great, you know, great place to work and live. Um, and so, yes. There used to be a binary that, you know, industry was not a place to pursue basic science, except for, you know, a place like Bell Labs, which obviously doesn't exist. Now we're seeing that this is possible, whether it's a Google, some biotechs. I wonder if you can reflect on what you're hearing from students who have gone into industry but want to retain a basic science and an even independent research agenda. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's where the sophistication of the students is coming online because, you know, you could be, you know, someone that would be a founder of a biotech startup. And so you get the business sort of on the job training at the same time as driving, you know, science that, that in general, they created themselves as graduate students, or you can go straight to like a larger sort of industrial position. And so there are scientist positions, but they're also ones that are postdoctoral that are meant directly for, at, you know, academic research and publications as being, I would say the metric for success. Um, and then, you know, national labs are the same way. Um, and then, you know, some people want more schooling, right? They want to get involved in patent law. They want to get involved in different types of sort of, you know, consulting or go more on, you know, other sort of, uh, not national lab, but state and local government as well. Chris, so I have a student that just went to the California Energy Commission. Uh -huh. Well, we've talked, sure. we've talked about biotechnology. We haven't really talked about Silicon Valley. Have you yep. pursued partnerships with, you know, the big tech firms that are interested both in human health and in sustainability? Um, not, not directly. I would say that we're still uh, more uh, aligned with industries that are in the biotech sector at this point. I've had several students go into startups uh, that are sort of energy-based startups and kind of jumped around from place to place. Um, and so I think that those are most of the sort of connections, but we, as a laboratory, we haven't collaborated directly uh, with Silicon Valley folk. Are the Googles and the Intels of the world, are they thinking about things like artificial photosynthesis? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I would say that, uh, you know, everybody is looking to uh, lower, right, their sort of carbon uh, footprint. And so I think that, 
it's also geared towards being more efficient and research and using, you know, AI and machine learning as a tool, right? So if it's a needle in a haystack, you want to find the needle sooner. And so you don't want to dig through the entire haystack. It's a question of where can you find the localized places, right? To increase your probability. And I think that that's where these companies are headed towards. So for example, a catalytic reaction you want to optimize, then this is the power of it as opposed to before this, the high throughput screening was thought to be the way to go about it, right? Or if you can screen really quickly, that will be good. But if you're not looking in the right place, right? Uh, diversity in the screen is, is most important. The one area we haven't covered for graduate students is of course, those who want to go on to academia. So, you know, reflecting mm -hmm. on your own experiences as a, as a junior professor, to what you're seeing from your graduate students and postdocs who have taken academic positions, What's harder now, even than 20 years ago, about starting up as a professor? Where are the pressures even bigger than when you began? Yeah, so I would say the biggest pressure is funding. I think that uh, research has become more expensive, in a lot of ways good, uh, because the personnel costs, stipends, uh, tuition have gone up over the years. And so I think uh, stipend, I think, is a really good thing, but it still means someone has to pay for it. So like the National Institutes of Health, it's had a flat budget since 2000. And so if you adjust for inflation, it's nowhere near the same buying power. And then if the stipends have gone up, then there are fewer opportunities for people to be educated and supported on the same size of funds. And so uh, at least for me, I, I've heard from a lot of early career investigators that funding is a, is a, is a pressure that it's always a pressure but I think it's more of a pressure than it was 20 years ago. What about was... service work? Where, where, What's the right blend for junior professors to take on administrative responsibilities while also not overburdening them because that's not what they're there fundamentally to do? Yeah, so we, in general, I think like most universities is try to minimize the service requirements, especially when you think about it, these are people that are pre-tenure and so they haven't been guaranteed uh, right, a job. And so therefore, I don't think it's fair for them to basically have to participate in the service and running of the university until that commitment has been made to them, mm -hmm. right, philosophically. So I think that uh, the service is meant to get them integrated in the community, rather than, you know, fulfilling a duty or responsibility. It's to sort of show them that this is the way things work. And that this is how we're all working together. And so I think that's the sort of point of service for a junior professor, early career professor is the, is the community. Chris, moving the conversation closer to the present, when COVID hit, did you see an opportunity to get involved in virology and vaccine research? You know, we, we did, but I think that um, we were actually looking at uh, copper as antivirals and sort of trying to understand, um, you know, basic aspects of that. What does that mean, but copper I, as an antiviral? Yeah, so uh, so it's actually, a, 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 it's also an antibacterial. So if you go back to like, you know, old, old days, like, you know, copper jewelry, copper sort of silverware, cups, right? Uh, all of that you would use to store uh, water and it would stay um, you know, uninfected, right? It would be clean. And, you know, now we know that it's both a uh, surface antiviral and antibacterial, right? And so you can dope in copper or silver into a drinking fountain at a hospital and it's much less, uh, you know, it's, it's much cleaner door handles, et cetera. So, um, and so that's, uh, you know, something that we sort of uh, involved with some of the basic mechanisms of how those could be used. But obviously, in terms of like therapeutics, the, the vaccines and antivirals that are more broad spectrum, um, you know, that's the that's the applied, right? But what these are, sort of ancient remedies are interesting. Does that, is that at all relevant for, for mRNA technology? Um, I would say that you use these in combination. So I would say if you have broad spectrum antivirals, you can probably potentiate that with changes in metal nutrients as well. 
And so some people might be predisposed, right, to having, say, a, a low copper, low iron diet or like a distribution uh, that could help or hurt them if they're taking, um, you know, anti antivirals or antibiotics, depending on the disease. Administratively, was this research enough to allow you to keep your lab open in a way that if you weren't doing COVID research, you had to shut down in most cases? No, we, we shut down completely for three and a half months for wet lab work. Um, and then we went into shift work like many groups across the country. So we did not, um, we did not do anything special uh, during the COVID time. I mean, most of the COVID time was uh, making sure that the morale of the laboratory yeah. uh, was, what you know, was good, and we we came through it really well. You know, we had a lot of sort of uh, virtual group dinners, things of that sort, which was uh, which was really nice. A lot of things like you could get delivered, and everyone would bake their own pizza <laughs> together <laughs> or make their own noodles. Um, you know, and so those things were actually kind of um, weird in 2020 hindsight, but at the time it was like the only way that people could see each other. The forced experiment of shutting down the lab, obviously a wet lab, you have to, you have to just stop dead in your tracks. Was there opportunity, you know, to just sort of step back and is this a good time for data analysis, for writing deeper papers? Is there yeah. any remote kind of automated research that you can do? What, what were your options during this time? Yeah. So I think the thing is we, uh, we had a backlog of research papers to write up. And I think that one thing we did was it gave people time to sit down and write. Um, and so at the very beginning of that time, we actually were a lot more productive in terms of like the paper output, because we had time to sit and to think about things. Then in terms of data analysis, I think that it did move us towards um, using more core facilities where we could mail samples out um, and then work more on the data analysis as opposed to uh, doing things locally ourselves. And so because we weren't paying for supplies, then you you were basically paying for you know people to do sequencing for you or uh, you know paying for um, like animal breeding, things of that sort to make mouse models that you would have done yourself, but then, and so some of that's been kind of interesting because team sizes can can also vary, and then team compositions can also vary. And so I think that for us, we we did actually pivot to do things that were more biological, because there was, um, in terms of density of people that was needed, uh, was not as much. You mentioned the importance of morale, you know, for graduate students who are living on their own, especially for international students who are truly isolated. How did you lend a helping hand remotely during this period? Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, we we met regularly, both one-on-one -on -one as well as the full group, you know, by Zoom. So no one, um, no one, you know, was alone or didn't have human contact for days. Um, you had to do most things through screens. Um, and then later on, because the weather was good, we were able to do things outside for most of, you know, the rest of that year, um, you know, with distancing. And I think that uh, those are sort of intrinsic advantages <laughs> of a warm weather place. But I think it's the the combination of, of meeting people one on one and then having them in group settings as well. We tried all sorts of things like a not just a normal Zoom, but like these gather programs, which is kind of like a Super Mario yeah, Brothers game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, that, that was OK. That wasn't so, so bad with a group of 20 people or so. Um, and then other people, they were still able to go like, I don't know, play tennis together, uh, you know, things of that sort where, you know, it was, it was low density in terms of the number of people. Going back to a question about personal identity and what you had discovered about yourself coming back to California. During COVID, of course, this was a this was a dark time for for how Asian Americans felt and the damaging rhetoric that came from the news media, from even unfortunately from from the government, you know, including the president. What did you learn about yourself and the country during this time? Well, I mean, I you know, it, it did sort of, uh, to be honest, take me back to you know growing up because I you know thought about it in terms of like there there is. There is always like someone who's the other, right? 
Um, and so, but at the same time, it was sort of oddly because people were so isolated, uh, it didn't really make, I guess, that much of a, an impact on me because we just didn't see that many people. Yeah. <laughs> so if you didn't, if you don't doom scroll too much, uh, then, uh, you know, I would say that, uh, but, but we also were lucky to live in an area of the country uh, which was not as polarized. I would say the Bay Area was quite compliant with a lot of, you know, things like masking and high vaccine uptake. And so in that way, the homogeneous population of, of people made it um, much better in the pandemic than uh, beginning times and others. But it's still hurtful. It's definitely hurtful. And you, it's, you know, people are people, right? And so it does, it does show you that it, it, it can turn, it, it can definitely turn on a dime. I mean, what's happening right now with the Middle East shows you another example, right? It's just, it goes to the next thing. Was the diversity and equity and inclusivity infrastructure at Berkeley, was it, was it a positive resource for lowering the temperature of some of these tensions? I, I do think so. Um, and also, as I said, because um, kind of compliance with health regulations was a big one. I think that the campus did a very good job with, with really paying attention to people's uh, sort of health in that way. I mean, it's, it's more challenging now, I would say that like, uh, it's just a high density of people. Um, but during that time, I think that they, they did a very good job of, 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 you know, uh, making good policies. Chris, of course, the pandemic was an unmooring experience for a lot of people thinking about what they were doing and where they were doing it. Was this the, the origins of you thinking that you might move a professorship at some point? Uh, you know, to be honest, uh, yeah, it did. It, it was one of the contributing factors. I think realizing that some of the work uh, could be done remotely and then, you know, connecting with people faster uh, all over the world, I think made us all feel a little bit less sort of rooted in the physical uh, sort of building as opposed to the people, right? And so in a lot of ways, the silver lining is that been able to connect a lot more with people that are outside Berkeley uh, because we can do, right, these sorts of things that we would not be doing, right? Right. Um, you know, it'd be a phone call, right? Um, and it's not the same as a sort of conversation. And so for me, it was almost like having a, a mini sabbatical like not, not a good sabbatical, right. but, <laughs> but, but knowing that the lab was okay, people were okay and that you could be away. And so it, it, it does sort of, you know, you think about, okay, you've been doing something for 20 years. Uh, there's a lot more time left in a professor's life. It's like, Oh, why don't, why don't we try the experiment and do it all over again? What would you do differently? What would you do in a place which is the polar opposite of what you're used to and very happy with? But I think that the pandemic did make people reflect in different ways. And for us, you know, thinking about that not having to physically be in this location, you know, to do the, the science and, and meet new people to interact with them. Um, all of the relationships that you've built, all the research that you've done across across campus, across the Bay Area, the power of inertia to just keep on doing it. Why mm -hmm. did you overcome all of that when you started to seriously consider the offer from Princeton? Uh, well, you know, as I said, it's like a, you know, stage in life where uh, it, it was ripe for a change. You know, we kind of had a pause during the pandemic. Uh, but then also being, you know, married to another professor here. Um, it's a two professor household. Uh, our daughter is eight years old. So we have one child. And so this time to, to move at this time, it's flexible. Better now than in high school. Late, moving later is not flexible. And so a lot of things kind of came together at the same time. And it was like a kind of a heart wrenching decision, to be honest. I think that um, some people are still super shocked that this is occurring. Um, and sometimes existentially, I'm not sure if, you know, it's like a meta thing. Am I actually in a simulation? 
doing this like <laughs> experiment or am I going to wake up and it was like, oh, it was a dream and I've been here the whole time. Well, when you're freezing in February next year, you'll know that it's a reality. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, the weather, it's luckily not as cold as Boston. Right. I mean, we've been out a, a few times and I think, um, but that, but it is, it's, a, it's sort of a different area. I think having this sort of Philly, New York nexus it's just a different type of uh, hub, yeah. right? There's the Boston hub, there's this New York Philly hub, mid-Atlantic, uh, there's DC, right? Then you've got like the Bay Area, then you've got like LA, then you've got San Diego. And like, those are, I think on the coasts, the major, you know, kind of centers of, of higher education in a lot of ways. Do you have collaborators or colleagues on the faculty at Princeton who have given you sort of an insider's view of what makes Princeton special, what you'll be able to accomplish there? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the thing is it's, it's super exciting. And I think it's the trajectory of Princeton as a university, as well as chemistry in particular. So, uh, you know, Michelle and I, we're uh, two of eight new professors that they've hired in the past 12 months. All senior? Uh, mixture. It's a mixture of junior and senior. And it reminds me again of the way it was 20 years ago when you have this big flux of brand new people. And, and I feel that there's an excitement uh, associated with it of the sort of the new blood, so to speak. And so that's something that's really exciting is a bunch of new people. Then the other thing that's exciting is, is to try a, a, you know, an environment again where you could get to know, you know people across campus. And then, as I said, the proximity to two, two, not just one UCSF, but like two actually sort of medical communities, I think gives us a, it's just a different opportunity for us right now. And then the, you know, the local industry, my wife is uh, much more tied into the pharmaceutical industry and biocatalysis. And so it's attractive for her as well. And it's a great place to raise a family, despite the weather. It, it's a, it's a small town of 25,000. There's like one middle school, one high school. And I think kind of it brings me full circle to being more of a small town person Yeah, in my upbringing. And so there were a lot of things that were attractive about it. And it's nothing like we do love being here. So, so any, um, you know, anything that we could do to sort of support or add value to, to Berkeley and the same thing with Caltech, it's like, I think that, you know, makes me smile when I think of these sorts of places that I've been lucky enough to be at. Well, now that we're peering into next steps for you for the last part of our talk, I'd like to ask a few retrospective questions sure. and then we'll end looking to the future. So, you know, having a hand both in the fundamental research and the translation, I wonder if you can talk about the satisfactions of each, the satisfactions of discovery for its own sake and the satisfactions of a breakthrough that has tangible societal impact. What do each mean for you? Uh, you know, I would I would say you know pursuit of knowledge. I think it's it's really satisfying to kind of as I said see something, to be the first one to see something that no you know sort of other person has recognized, um, and I think that uh, and you're doing it together, right? Because professors we we do it with research groups, we do it with students, and so we're always constantly learning. And I think there's just something that will always be exciting about that. Um, and so that type of open-ended question and answer and that sort of cycle. But I think that, uh, you know, as you sort of, you know, move on in a career, uh, you do you do want something to sort of give back and, and be something that is a benefit to society. And so I think that having one foot into new knowledge for its own sake is important. And then, you know, having that knowledge, uh, you know, be used for responsible purposes, right? That could help others. I think that that's, you know, that's very rewarding. And it really is all about the people. I mean, in the end, a professor is a teacher first and foremost. And so, you know, as I said, like our poor business skills of having zero retention, <laughs> um, I think that that's uh, of the people you work with, uh, uh, it's it's actually the best thing, right? Because you watch them and it's almost like you're.
And the last thing I heard was it's almost like you're, you were talking about the students. Oh, yeah. No, I was saying it's almost like a cat with nine lives, but but in the end, like a professor gets to live many, many more lives than that. Um, so I was saying I've had about 200 students uh, have trained in the laboratory, thousands that have gone through the classroom. And I think, you know, sort of watching their journeys and growth and what they do afterwards, uh, that's incredibly rewarding. And so whether they do basic science or they translate something right into a product, uh, it it really is something that helps it helps society right by helping people chris you've been you've been honored and awarded in many more ways than we can cover in our remaining time together but i want to ask a specific question about the sociology of scientific awards and recognitions are there any that stick out in your memory that are satisfying not just because it's great to get recognized but because either in the connections that it makes or in the heads that it might turn, actually amplify the science that you're able to do? Um, I, I would say that, you know, definitely proud of the teaching award uh, at Berkeley, just because I think that was uh, all of the sciences across campus. Um, and it sort of showed that uh, it was not just like, you know, performance in the classroom, but new curriculum development. And so we launched a new major, right? There have been thousands and thousands of students that have gone through this major. And I think it's changed education uh, to show that chemistry and chemical biology uh, are linked, right? They're connected. And so I think that that's had a, a pretty big impact, um, you know, beyond, you know, undergraduate to graduate education as well. Um, so I would say that that's nice, even though, like, I guess it's a, a local, but not national sort of scale thing, which most people, um, you know, would say that, oh, that's more visible. But I think that, you know, being able to sort of reach that many students, you know, at a, at a place like UC Berkeley, like with the breadth of the students, the depth of them and the sheer number, right? You're impacting a lot of people more than if you win some ACS award and you give a nice talk at a, sure. right? At a banquet, it's like, it's nice to be recognized by your by your peers but they're really recognizing the students that are in the laboratory as opposed to, I think, a teaching award that actually is about the students that were sort of educated through that process. It shows where your priorities are too, obviously. Mm -hmm. Well, finally, Chris, last question looking to the future. You've already indicated your openness to a variety of new research, new, mm -hmm. new possible industry connections at Princeton. What about two areas we haven't covered you know, your openness for academic administration or even the obvious policy ramifications of your academic expertise, both in, in, in biotechnology and in sustainability. Are these areas where you might consider going into at the more senior parts of your, your academic career? Um, well, I guess what it says at Berkeley, I've actually done a, a huge amount of administrative work already. <laughs> so, uh, I, you know, I've, I've led the chemical biology graduate program in our T32 uh, for almost 12 years now. Um, and so a uh, big hand in graduate education. I've served vice chair for our department, um, as well as on uh, the full campus committee. It's kind of like the equivalent of our Supreme Court, <laughs> where it's like all appointments, promotion, tenure, uh, retentions were all through that committee. So there was only nine of us. And so I've served at that level as well. Uh, so maybe not as many front facing things, but things I think that kind of keeps the gears of the university running. Uh, you know, moving to Princeton, I think that I'll probably take a step back and start with research and teaching first, and then uh, see what happens. Um, I feel like you want to sort of learn about a place mm -hmm to see where best you can contribute. I think uh, I wouldn't be so, I guess, egotistical to think that I would know best of how to run something in a place that I've never been at before. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's, I guess that's the way I would, I would think about it. So I would obviously be happy to help any place that I'm at get better uh, and add value to that. But I think that uh, at the very beginning, I'd like to learn more about the place and what it needs first. And then what about just as an addendum on that being a short train ride from Washington, D.C.? Is that something that you're interested in as well? Um, probably not at this point. 
to be honest. I think that, you know, uh, the government is sort of one pillar, right, of the sort of the scientific process. And, and right now, I think that um, I'm looking more locally in terms of like what, what we can do first, because if you want to sort of go to Washington, I think that you, you have to have a specific advocacy. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that there are people that are better placed to do such things right now. So it's all about the research and the teaching. This is almost like going back to an earlier part of your career at this stage. A, a, a little, a little bit, a little bit, I would say maybe. And then like a, but then in five years, if we have another conversation, if I'm department chair, then... <laughs> so... we'll, we'll have to check in. Well, Chris, yeah, we'll I want to thank you so much for spending this time. It's been a terrific conversation. I'm most appreciative. Oh, great. Yeah, no, no, thanks. I. I...